champion Mike Tyson for the world heavyweight title. Win or lose, Bruno as number one contender will receive the biggest purse ever given to a British boxer. But has Bruno gained his place in the ring by merit or manipulation? If you want to be number one, you have to beat numbers two, three, four and five and Frank simply hasn't done that. Tonight, we tell the story of how Frank Bruno got his crack at the title and we investigate the business of boxing. I think it's as close to 17th century buccaneering um, as exists on the planet today. And if boxing existed really in the 15th century, the Borgias would be the promoters. meets the fearsome Mike Tyson and Britain's local hero has his one chance of international fame. It's undoubtedly one of the major events of the year but is it really about the best in boxing? Some say that the making of Frank is less to do with his skill inside the ring and more to do with manipulations outside and Saturday night's fight is not about the sport of boxing but about the business. Phoenix, Arizona. Here a daily audience has watched Frank Bruno rehearse for the big fight. As the number one contender, he has an automatic right to challenge Tyson. That is the achievement of Terry Lawless, Bruno's manager. In a career which spans 30 years, he's unlikely to exercise the same skill again in marketing his man. The heavyweight title is the crown of crowns in boxing. Frank Bruno has dreamed of winning it since childhood. Okay, round three. But win or lose, he knows that a slice of the largest purse in the history of British boxing, around $6 million, is now within his reach. If titles were won on training, then Bruno would be champ. But they aren't. They come from fighting. But others who have fought harder and better have failed to match Frank's ride. So is it politics or punches which matter in the ring? Tim Witherspoon, world champion in 1986, met Frank Bruno to defend his title. You said I had a big gun. You said it. Uh, your people got in the way. We couldn't see you. Talk to me after I knock your boy out, okay? His prediction proved correct. He knocked Bruno out in the 11th round. He later lost the title, but has since had four wins, an identical record to Bruno. But while Frank has risen in the ratings, Tim has dropped dramatically, and at home in Philadelphia, the debts pile up. Came out after being interviewed, and my car is uh, repossessed. How much did you owe on the car? I owed about two months, two, three months. How much is that? That's, that's roughly uh, $1,400. And you didn't expect it to be taken? No, because I, I was on the borderline of paying it. I was getting people to help me um, get it together and get my career together. On Saturday, Bruno faces a champion who has already beaten seven challengers. If his manager is concerned, it's because it's now or never. Time is running out for the 27-year-old. But some critics believe Bruno shouldn't even be in the ring. Frank will probably be knocked out before he takes too much punishment. The fighters that really take a pounding are the guys that stand up and, uh, you know, fight back. Uh, Frank Bruno, the only times he fought while the opposition was knocked out. And I think the uh, most likely scenario would be that Bruno will be knocked out rather quickly, go back to England with a few million dollars in his pocket, and be none the worse for wear. Bruno's career began well. At 18, he was Britain's youngest ever amateur heavyweight champion. In 1985, three years after turning professional, he beat Anders Eklund in four rounds to become European champion. 
He also automatically moved up in the ratings of the world's top ten. But how do experts judge him now? Uh, in European terms, he's outstandingly good. I mean, he Bruno probably is one of the best European heavyweight champions that we've had, certainly in my time in boxing. But there's a vast gulf between a good European champion and a legitimate contender for a world title. And Bruno, with the general feeling anyway, with the knowledgeable people in the trade, is that he isn't capable of bridging that, that gulf. Both times when Bruno has tried to bridge that gulf, he's been beaten. Defeat at the hands of terrible Tim Witherspoon, a two times world champion. He was also knocked out by young James Bonecrusher Smith. Okay, round seven. Frank Bruno has had 32 fights as a professional. His two defeats have not deterred me fans and some of the British press, who have held fast to the dream that Bruno will be our first heavyweight champion in 100 years. Defeats may be easily forgotten. But how memorable have been his wins? Tom Stevenson, 21, a full-time night cleaner from Indianapolis. First round knockout. Official inquiry into the mismatch. Curse withheld. Scott Ledoux, 34, fought champions when younger. Came into the ring overweight and undertrained. Third round knockout. Last fight of career. Jerry Curtsy, 32, former world champion. Overweight and undertrained. First round knockout. Last fight of career. Bruno, only two fights away from Tyson, then took on the shambling Chuck Gardner, 37. He lasted 59 seconds. Immediately after, Chuck Gardner closed the door on his uneven fight career. He's now a laborer in Minnesota. He received three weeks' notice of the match, and he hadn't fought for eight months. He took it, he says, because it was staged in France, and he fancied some sightseeing. He mixed acute jet lag with almost no training. Did he feel in shape when he stepped um, into the ring? Not like I should have been. No, I... Lack of sparring partners and stuff, this and that, you know. I was run, running, you know, and not even then it wasn't even doing much as I should have. So. so why do you reckon Bruno's manager, Terry Lawless, would have thought that you were a good person to fight him? Um... They're just looking for opponents, you know, because they, they don't want to get someone there to beat them. They, I you mean, know. you felt that they felt you were a safe bet? Right. Seven, eight, nine. And he's going to let him box on. And he's pinned. 16 months ago, Bruno's last opponent was Joe Bugner. He was 37 and a tubby weight. The towel has come in from the Australian's corner. In boxing, soft opposition is known as feeding fighters stiffs and bums. Most boxers receive a small dose, but has Bruno had too much of the diet? A fighter needs a clean sheet. He needs to be 30 and 0 or whatever. He needs to learn his trade along the way. Well, um, I've got a fair idea when I look at opponents, you know, what they would be like for, for one of my fighters, which is my job. You know, that they would extend them, that would give them some experience, but my guy would win. That's a that's, you know, manager's job. Some people have said that the opponents that Frank's faced have been less than less than good, and particularly, for example, um, Chuck Gardner and Scott Ledoux. How, as a manager, do you explain that? Oh, I haven't got to explain it. I mean, Chuck Gardner was presented to me as a guy that had won his last five fights. Uh, it was an ordinary fight on an ordinary bill. You know, it wasn't even top of the bill, so I have no concern over that. I don't really take any notice of people, the, the experts that, you know, write or say and really know very little about it. Um, Bruno has fought some very good opponents and he's done very good jobs with them and he's rated number one in the world so I must have done my job and he must have done his. Hello Phil. Yeah, how you doing today? Good, good. Expert What's Nigel Collins the runs a top ten in the prestigious American magazine he edits The Ring. Voted by 50 journalists, it says that ten other boxers have a greater right to meet Tyson than Bruno. It's important to emphasize that every fighter, including Mike Tyson, fights the kind of opponents that Bruno has fought on their way up. It's part of the building process. But usually, a fighter will gradually uh, step up the quality of his opponents as he goes along. Uh, that's something that hasn't happened uh, with Frank Bruno. He's stayed at that level uh, with uh, second raters at best. Yeah. Bruno is dedicated. In a 16-month delay caused mainly by Tyson's troubles, Bruno has been determined to stay fit, and he hasn't put a foot wrong. But neither has he risked a fight, and with it, Saturday's jackpot. 
So with this track record, how is he ranked by the boxing authorities? There are four rival bodies in the sport. The World Boxing Council, the World Boxing Association, the International Boxing Federation, and the World Boxing Organization. When they endorse a championship fight, they receive a share of the purse. On Saturday, it's $200,000. Each body runs its own top 10, and wide discrepancies occur. Frank Bruno is the number one in the WBC and the WBA tables, but number three in the IBF rankings, and he doesn't appear at all in the WBO's top 10. In Las Vegas, one of the most influential men in the WBC says openly that considerations other than a fighter's punching power may influence the ranking committees. But I believe that I would be naive, and we would all be naive to think that does politics enter into ratings? Yes, it does. Uh, much to the extent that why is this person hired with this company when this one's more qualified? Well, perhaps he knew somebody in the company. So I think that it's naive to assume that uh, there's no politics in ratings. I believe there is politics. And I think that in the long run, it all works out. It doesn't seem very much of a sportsmanlike way to run, to run, a, run the show. He said boxing is sportsmanship. I mean, it's business. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Boxing within the state of Nevada is a sport. But the state of Nevada, two years ago, we generated $300 million of revenue into the state of Nevada from boxing. Now, is that a sport, I ask you? Or is it a business? It's a darn good business. The business of Frank Bruno is handled by the most powerful men in British boxing. Terry Lawless, his manager, has trained four world champions. Mickey Duff, the matchmaker, selects Bruno's opponents. Jarvis, a stare millionaire businessman, promotes his fights. When Bruno turned professional, these three were part of a strong monopoly. Only they could give a boxer access to television and major matches. Unknown to boxers, they pooled their profits. The USA forbids managers and promoters to work together in this way. Three years ago, the British Boxing Board of Control investigated and decided these activities were not detrimental to the interests of boxers. Their partnership continues. I think the people that handle Bruno are very canny. I think from a point of view of uh, managing him in order to make the most money with the least risk, they've done an excellent job. The injustices of the rating system can defeat some management, however successful, and good fighters suffer. Chris Pyatt is 25. In his career as a professional, he's had 26 wins and two defeats. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's boxing and the hope of your contest, Mr. Tonight's fight in the East End is part of a warm-up towards winning back the light middleweight championship of the world. For now, Pyatt buys his own license to fight, and big purses remain a dream. When's that to make? Next February. That, no, next February. Okay. That will be to the 31st of January, 1990. And then uh, you, to the 31st of January. And then pray God when you're the world champion, I'll come back and I'll call you next year. For American Russell Mitchell, it's a long way to come for a brief performance. Chris Pyatt is managed by Frank Warren. Relatively new to boxing, Warren has now broken the monopoly held by Bruno's management, and he's done it by having his own fight shown on ITV. He says the reverses in Chris Pyatt's world ratings can't be explained by his performance inside the ring. Going back to June last year, he had a win, and he was ranked number nine in the ratings. And then within the course of two and a half weeks, he had three fights and three wins, and he was knocked out of the ratings. He wasn't in number 30. And what can a boxer do about that? Well, he can't do anything. It affects his chances. I mean, we've complained about it. We've managed to get him back in. But I can't understand why he was dropped out. Chris Pyatt, unbeaten again, knocking out his opponent in the fourth round, has his own views. The WBC, uh, I think, are very political. And um, if you're not managed by the right people, then, uh, you know, that tends to happen. It's, it's politics more so than uh, boxing. When you say politics, I mean, what do you mean? I mean Who you manage by and you promote and whatever, you know, if you're sort of either on one side of the fence or the other, then, you know, it helps sort of in which rating to get. In the States, too, some fighters find they need muscle outside the ring as well as in to beat the system. 
Tim Witherspoon was managed by the buccaneer of the ghetto, Don King. I'm telling you, you better talk to me because I don't like what's going down here. Now Tim Witherspoon and his family are forced to live in a rented flat. He claims a dispute with Don King over money for the Bruno fight have left them all impoverished. And for the sake of the children, he says, he's now suing his former manager. He's already paid the price. Although he's continued to win, his ratings have dropped dramatically. He is number three in one ranking, but 26 in another. And the family income has slumped. I won a fight and I dropped down. Usually when you win, you go up. I lost the championship, won three fights, and he dropped me to 15. So that, that means that his friend, whoever's running that division, he told him, hey, get him out of here. We got a big lawsuit on this and who he think he is, get him out of here. How much money is involved in your lawsuit? It's a $25 million lawsuit, uh, 19 counts with various different uh, charges, uh, racketeering, uh, monopoly, uh, uh, a lot of, lot of different um, um, counts. And I'm sure that, um, I'm sure with the law firm that we have, that we're, we're, something will come out, some justice will come out. In Las Vegas, the man who once served four years for manslaughter is conducting business as usual. Don King has dominated the heavyweight scene as a promoter since 1974 and is now advisor to Tyson. He's also wooing back the lightweight champion of the world, Julio Cesar Chavez, after yet another battle about money. If you need any dinero, anything, just if call on me. I got mucho dinero, no mucho, problem. Mucho. Yes, okay. <laughs> Let's have a look at Tim Witherspoon. Tim Witherspoon fights Frank Bruno. He claims that he should have had a purse of half a million dollars. He takes home $98,000. He then sues you. In the middle of that confrontation with you, suddenly his ratings plummet. He goes from number nine to number 16 in the ratings without having lost a fight. Explain that to me. It, it's so easy to explain it to you. First, now, first of all, Tim Witherspoon now only got the 500,000. He got 800,000. See, that's what I'm trying to tell Why you. Why did he sue you then? He, he sued me because of people like you that go out and listen to people saying things, and so he started chasing ghosts and apparitions rather than trying to find out the facts. They had an, a commission investigation right here in Nevada, and the commission totally exonerated me, and I gave Tim Witherspoon a release. I said, I no longer want you to be around me. I said, because you don't have the capability, nor do you have the understanding to deal with me because you are ignorant. But some people say that you, for example, have an undue influence on the WBC rating. I consider it an accolade that one would consider me, one as low, lowly as myself and one as humble as myself, to be able to have such overwhelming power over all individuals. In other words, we are saying that all these individuals are corrupt, we are saying that these individuals cannot make decisions for themselves, that these individuals are selfless, you know, devoid of commitment of word because they would allow someone like myself or any one person to be, have irrepressible power over another human being. Well, that demeans both the person that you have the power over and yourself. But it's understandable if many millions of dollars are involved. I'm sure people can be that malleable, can't they? Well, that's if you say that everybody's dealing on a corrupt a thesis. Joe Spinelli is also interested in the corruption thesis. He's investigated the fight game as a member of the FBI and, more recently, as New York State's first Inspector General of Fraud. How does he measure Don King's influence? King is, is not unique. There are other promoters that do the same thing. And Don King, quite frankly, is not the problem. The problem is a lack of a uniform, cohesive body and a system to regulate the sport properly. That's what's necessary. So what's preventing that happening? I think that the, there is so much money at stake. The stake is now huge because of the impact of TV and the cable networks like HBO. HBO has signed Tyson to a $27 million eight-fight contract. The Bruno match is number four. HBO pours dollars into the ring, but what does the ring do for HBO? That's pretty simple. We're trying to get new subscribers. We have no advertising. We have no commercials. So our goal, my mandate, is to put on programming that's going to attract new subscribers. We have 17 million subscribers in the United States, and we're looking for programming that's going to attract new subscribers. Boxing, particularly World Championship Boxing, more specifically Tyson, uh, brings in new subscribers. So that's what we look for. That's what we try to measure when we try to figure out how much should we spend for a fight. 
boxing hasn't been so popular since the 50s, and HBO's ritzy techniques have helped. TV has undoubtedly been good for the money men in boxing, who never themselves get bloodied, but it hasn't necessarily been healthy for the sport. Television has created a monster. Television wanted title fights. In the old days, and, and the way we do the, the ratings here at the ring, there were only eight divisions, one champion in each weight class. Now we have 16 divisions, four different organizations. And the reason that they uh, sprang up was they created what television wanted, championship fights. The fact that these championship fights didn't mean anything, that they were um, you know, completely phony in many cases, didn't make any difference. A major asset for Frank Bruno is that TV likes fighters who look good, and he fits the role perfectly. He's also highly personable. In a string of chat shows in Los Angeles, he sells himself naturally. George, you're going to try and get my bag out so I want you to change my yeah. shirt, please. Yeah. Please. Do some body popping, yeah? Yeah. Oh. At NBC Studios, he spars with the shoeshine man. No, I don't. No, that, 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 that. No, I don't want to do that. No. For a shine stand. Shine stand. No, that's like slavery, man. I don't no, want to do too no much. I'll clean, I'll clean my own shoes. That ain't no slavery. Yeah. Uh, no. I'll clean my own shoes, man. No, I'll clean your shoes. I want, I want to take a picture of you. No, I'll, I'll, I'll clean your shoes, yeah? No, 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 no. Tell him I want to take a picture of him. Frank Bruno will be the latest man to try and take Mike Tyson's heavyweight title from him. This fight has been forged by the power of the dollar. But boxing's magnet is there's always just the chance that even the best can be felled. All right, Frank, here's the deal. Many have tried, all have failed. Why will you succeed? The power of personality is not dismissed by Terry Lawless. This is 1989. The, the days of just having a guy as a boxer was one thing. You know, if you've got a guy with a personality like Frank, then you must be aware of the the uh, business aside from boxing. You know, there's a very lucrative side of life, you know, aside from boxing. If you're someone like Frank Bruno, you know, you, he's done his hard work in, in making a celebrity of himself, making a name for himself. Uh, there's obviously lots of opportunities in, in television, advertising, sponsorship, that sort of thing, for someone like Frank Bruno. Just how much Bruno and his management will earn from Saturday's fight is not the easiest sum to discover as a press conference reveals. With respect, that's not your business or their business. That's our business. They're just going to ask the question. No, they'll ask the question. Well, they wouldn't get an answer from me. Asking others, these are the figures we've put together. Tyson and Bruno, no matter how brief their time in the ring, have founded a multi-million dollar industry. The Las Vegas Hilton, the largest hotel in the world, will more than recoup the seven million dollars it spent to promote the fight. One ticket can cost over 500 pounds, and fight fans are traditionally hard gamblers too. Out of the total in the pot for the fight, this will be the share for Bruno and his team. The Las Vegas Hilton pays two million pounds to stage the fight. Satellite Express showing the fight on closed circuit television in theaters and cinemas in Britain pays half a million. BBC TV and Sky pay around another half a million. Companies such as HP Foods, Mars and Nike may pay as much as a quarter of a million for Bruno's endorsement. This brings the total in the British pot to three and a quarter million pounds, of which Frank Bruno is thought likely to receive about a million. Yeah, it looks quite chilly as well. That's that. Mm. You like a bit of chilly as well? Show yeah. label. Oh, sorry, oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. What? Do in oh, the final days, the selling of Frank, the lad with a lot of sauce, never flags. And back in London at the agency Ogilvy & Mather, HP heads meet the ad people to give a patriotic punch to their product. They also discuss the delicacies of defeat and how to make the most of it. On the Saturday, we propose running this advertisement. There's no mistaking Frank's bottle. Um, that reinforces the link between Frank and HP. It also makes a, makes a positive statement. Yeah. The, the alternative would be, I suppose, we could run one on Sunday, which was you like could. both eventualities. Yeah. Um, the question of a topical well, touch is further complicated because when the first punch is thrown in Las Vegas in the early evening, it will be the early hours of the morning here. Even if Bruno, the great British institution, is temporarily demolished on Saturday, his future as a commodity is solid. But should good luck play his way and he wins, it will turn into pure gold.
Do you think he has a lifelong income as a personality? I would have thought so. Even uh, after his boxing career has finished, he's sufficiently well known to, to make a career in television as, as, a, as a TV personality. He could even go on to, to do um, commentating on, on sports and that sort of thing. He's sufficiently well known and loved uh, to, have a lo to have a long future, I think. Why do you think that is? Because we've had other heavyweight uh, contenders and they haven't seemed to have had the same clout as Frank Bruno. Um, I think it's because he's just such a nice guy. If you meet him, he's, he's so personable, so pleasant so down to earth and honest uh, and I think people like that and I think for a long time since since the days of Henry Cooper we've been looking for a British boxer who can carry the flag and uh, who everyone can be proud of and it doesn't matter if he's a loser exactly he'll be a winner in anyone's eyes anyway Frank Bruno on Saturday may find that his number one rating proves an inadequate shield against the mighty Mike Tyson in a dangerous profession you can only admire his courage but it's a sad day for any sport when the bankable replaces the best and cash means more than the spirit of genuine competition.